All right, well, my presentation's running a tiny bit long, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so my name's TJ Torres, uh, and I'm a data scientist at Stitch Fix. And so today I was hoping to talk with you a little bit about some of the recent work that I've been doing on using kind of a relatively recent uh, method in deep learning called uh, variational autoencoders, and using that to kind of develop a latent style space um, we're a women's clothing company, so to develop a latent style space for some of the image data that we have. Um, and I'll go into what all that means pretty, pretty briefly here. So um, just a little bit about me. So I'm on the algorithms team at Stitch Fix, and uh, there we have sub-teams of the algorithms team, and I'm on the, one of the teams called Data Labs. And sort of our purview in Data Labs is to do kind of experimental R&D where we tackle high-risk, high-reward ideas and so that allows me to kind of use some of these more experimental methods to analyze images and you know, do so in a business context. So just to give you a little bit of context about what Stitch Fix does, um, we're basically just a service where you can go online um, and sign up for an account and order what we call a fix. Um, and in that fix are personally styled items of clothing for you. Um, and then you, you know, can try them on, do whatever you wish with them for a little while, and then you send the ones that you don't like back to us and keep the ones that you do like. So sort of if we're doing our job correctly, you know, we hope that we could probably try to like maybe eliminate or at least reduce the time that you spend going out and shopping at maybe retail stores. All right, so the problem with that business model um, when it comes to scaling is that uh, as we try to serve our clients better and better, it means that we need to have a bunch more inventory in terms of clothing. Um, and so the way that we are styling for people is we have these professional stylists, they come in, they look at items of clothing and they take in some information about our, our clients and then they pick out items of clothing for them. So as our inventory gets larger and larger, it becomes pretty prohibitive for people to go through and actually look through every single item of clothing. And so thus enters kind of the data science regime where we're using recommendation algorithms to do a sort of pre-filtering. So we, we just take a subset of those clothes um, and then you know, present those to the stylist so that the stylist can make the best decision possible from, from there on in. Um, so if we did that process perfectly when we had lots of data, um, we'd still have this next problem which is called a cold start problem. So this is kind of a problem for everyone who does recommendation algorithms, which is that when you don't have any data whatsoever on either, you know, we have, sometimes we get new clients or new clothing, if we don't have any data on, on either of those whatsoever, it's really hard to do any sort of modeling on them. So we don't really know how to recommend those items of clothing to, you know, new clients. Um, so you can really boil this down into a four-step process. Um, <laughs> where this question mark is a really big question mark, and so it's something that we're still working on, in fact. But uh, sort of the way that I am hoping to tackle it is to do some, uh, some modeling uh, with images. So that when, when people sign up for our service, they give us access to their Pinterest boards. And so we get actually quite a bit of, or quite a number of images about kind of, kinds of clothing that they like. Um, and then also, you know, with our new clothing, we take pictures of every item that we have. So we have images of, of that as well. So I'm trying to use that to come up with sort of a style space so that we can use that style space to then do some future modeling on. Um, so uh, with images, basically, you know, the reason that we want to use images to begin with, right, and the reason that it would be nice, even if we didn't have this cold start problem, is that, you know, style's pr pretty primarily visual. Um, and so, you know, our window to the world digitally is through images. Um, and so we really want to be able to use those for our modeling purposes and to make our recommendation algorithms better. Um, the heuristics with, with which humans process images is pretty unclear right now. Um, you know, we, we know somewhat how like our retinas work and how our brains process that information to a certain extent, but we really like, if I were to describe to you how I decided that something was, for instance, like, uh, preppy in terms of like, you know, fashion, um, I, I would have no idea how to go about doing that, right? Like maybe I know it when I see it, but I can't really describe to you the process that I took to get to that conclusion. So, um, so it's pretty hard to develop sort of a heuristic algorithm to do this. It's also, we, we really don't want to try to do feature engineering on images, right? That, that actually requires quite a bit of domain knowledge, both in image processing and then also in fashion. And the, it's kind of surprising that the overlap between those two isn't super high. Um, 
So, so we're going to turn to something to kind of do our, our feature learning for us or our feature engineering for us, which is to turn to deep learning for some of these feature extractions and images. All right, so uh, just kind of an outline for the rest of the talk. That was kind of the, the stitch fix intro. And now, now things are going to move a little bit more into to generality. Um, so I'm going to give just a really brief introduction onto neural networks. Uh, and then I'm going to cover uh, unsupervised processes with those. Um, and then I'm going to use a specific framework called Chainer, which I've been really liking just for its readability. It's really nice. And I'll go through a really simple example of kind of just structuring your first forward pass through a network in order to try to train uh, models on images um, and then get some sort of output of those. So part of the, uh, the process when we do these variational autoencoders, you get this generative process so we can kind of inspect what's happening in our neural network, which are normally fairly abstract uh, by looking at what the generative output is. And then I will discuss a bit about the open source package that I developed and have put out there for people to install so that they can train their own models on their image sets. And I'll show some examples of things that people have done with it. OK. All right, so a little bit about neural networks. I'm pretty sure probably at this point most people have heard about them here. There was this kind of media sensation over the summer where uh, you know these uh, images came out from other generative models from Google, um, these Google Deep Dream images, which are pretty wonderfully trippy. Uh, <laughs> but basically, they can be used for a lot of like really practical purposes too, right? These generative models allow us to kind of inspect and see whether or not um, this is this is from uh, the draw networks that uh, were also constructed, and and you can see that this, it was trained on Google Street View data for uh, address labels, and you can see that. If it can reconstruct the data reasonably well, right? You you can or or even these are these are sort of randomly generated ones. So if we get randomly generated images that are quite similar to our original training set, then we can think that you know the encoded space or the space that we can or the vector space that we use for the modeling process that comes out of these is probably pretty good, right? It's at least memorizing something to do with with uh, with these images. So just a little bit of an introduction to neural nets for those of you who don't really know um, the ins and outs of how they work. This will be pretty brief, but, um, but hopefully it'll give you a little bit of an overview. So uh, we start with just an input. And the way that neural networks are structured is they're structured in layers. So we just have layers of neurons. And the neurons just hold pieces of data. So for this specific example, I have four pe or six pieces of data. Um, we could say that maybe this is six grayscale pixels in an image, something like that. Um, and then they get filtered through these lines, which are connecting uh, the different neurons on the top layer to the second layer. In actuality, I've only drawn one set of lines, but there should be sets of lines corresponding to each one of those second uh, nodes there. Um, and so those are just, this is just a, a linear mapping from the first input layer to the second. Um, so each one of those lines basically just represents a number that I'm multiplying that input data with. Um, and then I add in like usually an additional bias. And then filter that finally through some nonlinear function. And the reason for filtering it through a nonlinear function is that if I wanted to do a functional composition, which is basically what's going to happen as we filter through more and more layers of uh, linear functions, then the, the, whole, the whole reason that we call them linear functions is that that ends up being linear in the end. Um, so I want something that's going to do kind of a nonlinear mapping so that I can get something a bit more uh, a bit more telling about my data rather than just some kind of PCA-like transformation, right? Um, so, so why is this tangent not Oh, that's, I mean, there are, there are actually a number of diff different ones used. Um, the one that I'll use later is not uh, hyperbolic tangent. But um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think the, the original motivation is basically the fact that they kind of model neuron activation, so as like, your signal gets to um, so hyperbolic tangent, right? Uh, goes from you know has like kind of this brief spike. So as soon as you get past like a certain threshold, it's activated, and then um, and if you're below that threshold, it's not really activated. So I think that's kind of the inspiration for why tangent or hyperbolic tangent or sigmoids are used. Um, I'm going to be using rectified linear ones. So there's really no motivation for those beyond the fact that they're really easily computable and they're nonlinear. Um, so yeah, so we can filter through and we basically do a functional composition with these nonlinear functions. Um, and that gives us something that's really nonlinear. Uh, and I'll show an example of that. And then we calculate a loss function, um, something that's appropriate to our problem. So if we're doing a classification, 
we calculate a loss function based on how far off we were from the classification. If we're doing something like we're going to do uh, later on, we want to take the mean squared error between some reconstructed image and our original image. Um, and with, those, with that loss, we can basically do a gradient descent for these weights to try to minimize that loss function, right? So we go back, we kind of calculate this, this, uh, this is kind of where the magic happens here, right? This gradient for, for the loss function with each one of the weights and update them. And then we can, we can sort of see that this is really just going to involve a large number of steps in, in, a, in a chain rule, which is sort of thus the, the name chainer. Um, and, and that's it, that's, that's all we do. We back propagate and train those weights and over time we hope to minimize our loss function so it's just our objective, right? We hope to minimize that in order to do some sort of task. So if it's classification, we hope to minimize the number of misclassifications and we can train weights in order to do that optimally. Um, so as you get deeper and deeper, basically I've kind of touched on this before, but, that sh but shallow networks that are, you know, non, uh, that are not really nonlinear, uh, just approximate PCA, basically. So what, what, all we're doing with these neural networks, right, is we're taking sort of projections onto different spaces, right? So we can think of like our data lying in this like high dimensional Euclidean space. Really what we're seeking to do is take it into a lower dimensional space, but that lower dimensional space didn't need to be necessarily Euclidean space, right? I can think of all sorts of manifolds to project my points onto. Um, and so PCA chooses just hyperplanes, right? Uh, and so that's, that can be interesting and it's certainly useful sometimes, but it's also nice to have things like uh, local linear embedding and other things that are, that are sort of nonlinear processes and, and neural networks do a really good job of learning these nonlinear manifolds with which we can like kind of project our data down onto. And so you can do that with these functional compositions and I'll show here, you know, this is just a sine function on top, right, which is nonlinear in and of itself, but when you compose it with a bunch of other signs, you get something that's really nonlinear, right? So if you can think of like, maybe I couldn't fit my data with a sign function, but I could fit it with this really scribbly function, right? So that touches on the fact that will come, that will come up later, which is that you, know, you, can, you can usually do some pre a pretty good bit of overfitting when you have that, that amount of nonlinearity. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, so the general process with which people have been doing this for quite a while, and there are some unsupervised methods that people have been using too, but um, most of the methods that you're going to see are uh, deep learning with supervision, right? I give you a labeled training set, and you pass it through your network, and you compare uh, the output labels to the original labels that you know, I had on my set, or my training set. Um, and there are two real, real major portions to networks like this, one of which is kind of the feature extraction portion, and then the other just deals with, they're usually fully connected and they deal with the classification part. So what we wanna do um, in the unsupervised case is to take sort of the feature extraction part and then kind of throw away the classification portion, um, uh, and, and we'll see how we can do that later on. All right, so, so firstly, as I kind of mentioned before, there are issues for doing uh, the this, this supervised process with style, right? So issues for which like, we want to kind of try to tackle this from an unsupervised standpoint to begin with, right? And the reason is that there's really no, uh, there's no reliable system of labels. So if I ask you, you know, how would you describe this shirt? And you ask your friend how they would describe that shirt, usually it's going to be a pretty different description, right? Um, and you know, it's really hard to come up with some vector space with which we can kind of classify all of our different images at once. Um, so what we're going to do instead um, is turn to, uh, so, so instead of labeling our images, which, are, which would be rather noisy, we're gonna just turn to unsupervised learning. And so, the key to that's going to the thing that's going to be the key with this these unsupervised processes is to kind of compress the data and then re-expand the data and kind of compare the re-expanded data to the original um, and then that compressed section will be our latent space. What does that mean, the latent space? Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that for okay. sure. Yeah, um, don't worry. Yeah, I'm not going to just leave you there. <laughs> um, so yeah, so with these unsupervised methods, just like. Uh, if you were to un leave a toddler unsupervised, things can get rather interesting. Um, so autoencoders are pretty much the primary means by which people do these unsupervised deep learning methods. Um, 
And there are two processes kind of combined into one single model. One is uh, an encoding step or an inferential model, and the other is a decoding step or a generative model. So here's what I mean by the latent space. Um, so in this, in this diagram, you can see we have this original image, which I've kind of simplified down to maybe say I had like four pieces of data that describe that image, okay? Usually, you know, the images are 100 by 200 pixels and three color channels, that's like 60,000 parameters, but this, this diagram is very simplified. Um, so I start off with a layer of four neurons and I filter it down to a layer with three neurons, right? And I successively filter it down to uh, layers which have fewer and fewer neurons until I get to some sort of bottleneck, right? And I'm gonna call that my, my latent space. That's sort of the space um, that has, you know, the parameters which I find will be essential to describing what that image is. And what I mean by that is that I then have to use those parameters to try to reconstruct the original image, right? So if it didn't learn something about the original image in that compressed representation, I wouldn't be able to very faithfully reconstruct the image afterward. Okay, so, yeah. The output layer is exactly just an image. It's this, well, hope we hope the same image, yeah. The target is the original image, so that's what we're gonna use as like the target for our loss. Right, so when you say it's unsupervised, Yeah, the reason that we call these, you know, auto encoders, right, is it means that they're kind of like being compared to themselves, right? So, so I take in an original image, I filter it through this process to compress the data, I decompress the data using a very similar process, right, and they don't actually have to be symmetrical, but, um, you know, most people will structure them in symmetrical, reasonably symmetrical ways. Um, and then I compare my, you know, at first, when I first sort of initialize these, it's just everything's going to be random, right? And so the image that I'm going to get out is going to look an awful lot like just noise. But as I train this model over time uh, through like further and further, further iterations, I'm going to get something which looks a lot more like that right-hand image um, that I'm comparing to my original image in the loss function. So, and that right-hand image is actually a true to form, like reconstructed image from these models, so. Well, so we're training a model that's, that's generating, uh, you know, not, I don't just do this with one image, right? I do this with a bunch of different images and then I can pick random points in my encoded space and see what comes out of it. So that's what I mean when I say it's a generative model. Do you mean like I, I cannot further generate anything like more than what what the compression gives me? Yeah. I mean that's true that I can't exactly reconstruct this, right? But I can I can do a pretty good job. So in the in the sense that like in the same sense that like if I took a PCA of some of my data, right, and I I threw out you know there was a talk yesterday talking about nice thresholds for like doing these kinds of. Uh, um, eigenvalue manipulations, which is essentially what PCA is, right? If I threw out like, you know, 90% of my, uh, my PCA dimensions and just focused on the top ones, right, um, I would be doing the same thing. I'm still compressing my data and hopefully I get something that's reasonably good at, at uh, giving me back my original image. But what I mean by it's generative is that there is actually an inverse process, right? If I were to just completely cover this up after I train it, right, and I put in random parameters here, I can generate wholly new images from that. And so I'll show some examples of that later on. Yeah, no, that's it's a really good question. Uh, so the question is, how do I know how how many uh, how many um, latent dimensions to reduce to? Uh, and the answer to that is um, practice. Like, yeah, I, you you really just have to kind of play around with it and decide what for for a specific data set how how wide you want to be able to encode to. What are typical numbers? Like you said, that's so for for this model, I think this was I want to say thirty parameters, thirty latent parameters. So down from sixty thousand, it's not bad. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, there are some issues with these autoencoders, right? Uh, and then one of the issues is that they often will overfit the data. Um, there's another issue about gradient decay, but I'm not gonna go into that too much. Um, and so really the, the new thing that I'm doing here, right? That, those are just autoencoders. Those have been around for a while. So the new thing is to use a variational step at the encoding layer uh, to, to sort of regularize my training. Um, and I'll go into kind of what I mean about that in just a little bit. Um, so uh, in order to, to really just give you an example, I think it'd probably be best just to construct a network or like a simple forward pass through one of these networks and then you guys can construct them on your own later on and try to play around with them. Um, so there are a lot of deep learning frameworks to use. I'm gonna use uh, Chainer because I think it's nice and it's very readable. Um, it might not be the best at benchmarking and stuff, but if you, if you want to, if you want something to do, you know, rapid prototyping, it usually is quite useful, I think. TensorFlow. Yeah, TensorFlow, yeah. So that came out like right, as, right after I made this presentation, so that is not included. I actually haven't even looked at TensorFlow yet, so I don't really know its relative merits, but I plan on it at some point. All right, so a little bit of an intro to Chainer, right? So this is supposed to be an easy to use framework for neural networks, and it really just has pa two basic building blocks. One of, uh, one of which uh, is variables, which are just wrappers on ND arrays. And then the other are functions which operate on variables. And so given these two processes, basically uh, what Chainer does is it kind of turns a variable into both something that is numeric and symbolic. So when these function objects act on the variable objects, um, you get a sequence of memorized operations, right? So if I say two things were added together, um, it is memorized that one of those things was added to the other, as well as what the output of that adding is, right? So it makes, it go, doing this along the way by making these things variables um, takes up a little bit more memory for one, but um, it also uh, is immensely helpful when you're doing back propagation and auto differentiation, because then you just have all of the different operations that you've done and a nice computational graph and sequence and you can just propagate backward through that graph differentiating along the way. So just as a simple example of kind of how this works, um, here I've kind of highlighted that, that uh, this, I, I've taken X and Y, which are just ND arrays with one value in them, uh, five and three, and I'm highlighting here on this computational graph that what, how things are kind of being stored. So X is stored in this uh, blue float 32 box, um, Y is stored in this red one, and then as you filter down through the sequence of operations, you get uh, a value z, which is also a chainer variable, and if you call the attribute data, it'll return what the value of that is. Okay, so you can kind of inspect what your data is doing, but it also has this sequence, this memorized sequence of operations, so all of these different operations are stored, um, not the intermediate values, but the fact that they were operated on with a, a plus or the fact that they were exponentiated. That's all stored in these chain or variable objects. And so that makes it really nice to be able to go through and calculate the gradients by just calling dot backwards on my, on my uh, uh, whatever object I wish to calculate the, the backwards gradients on. So in order to define a neural network model with this, basically I have to use something called a function set, which is just kind of wraps all of my function objects together into a model. Um, and, and then I just have to really just define a, a forward pass, um, which is just kind of how I wanna structure my network, right? And then I wanna define, uh, or I have to pick an optimizer, which is, you know, so oftentimes people use gradient descent, but um, some of the more recent ones, like Atom, are the ones that I've been using. Uh, and then you just wanna make a script, which basically iteratively passes through that forward loop, calculates the gradients at the very end, and then passes th those gradients back through a backpropagation process. Um, and then that's, it's really easy to do. Once you've calculated your loss, you just call loss.backward and then optimizer.update and all of the weights are, are updated for you. Can you mention how you're defining the How I'm defining? Oh yeah, that's, so that's through auto differentiation on like, so, so you know, th these are effectively symbolic variables, so it's not too hard to define the gradients like going backward. Nope, that's all in Chainer. Uh, no, no, this is like literally like calling loss. Like I, I don't deal with anything under the hood, right? Like calling loss backward. 
is what I do, and then that actually calculates all of those gradients for you. Nope, all that, all that stuff is written for me, so I definitely don't want to write auto differentiation code. <laughs> um, yeah, and so some of the advantages of this are that you can construct pretty intuitive forward passes um, which are easily debugged because you can ex inspect the data at different times throughout the flow, right? Um, and then you can use sort of arbitrary control flow statements in some neural network packages like the interpreter. Um, you need to like add in some, some things for control flow statements with the interpreters. Uh, back propagation is super easy. Uh, you, like you saw, you just call dot backward and it does it for you. Um, and then there's a really high level of readability, which I'm about to show you here. So, uh, so yeah, let's build a simple autoencoder. So this is the model setup part. Um, so you still have to kind of declare, you don't actually have to declare it outright, but it's helpful to declare this um, and wrap it in this model function. So I basically just kind of stored a dict of uh, different layers. These f dot linear just correspond to linear layers, linear neural network layers of different sizes. And so I've structured, you know, encoding layers, decoding layers, wrap them up in this layers dict, and then use those as keyword arguments for chainer function set. And that gives me a model back, which has, I can call now model dot encode zero, thank you, and model dot encode one. And it'll, it'll, uh, it'll apply this function later on, this parametric function. And then I just set up the model by saying optimizer, I pick my optimizer and then optimizer setup. And then I pass it the model and everything's all set for me. This looks like PCA? This, this would look like PCA. So this, this isn't actually the, the full story, right? So like these linear models or these linear layers, if I just had this, that's true. But well, I'll show you what I'm doing to, I'm adding some nonlinearity in the mix too, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I structure it. I start off with a, an input here, um, and I just make it a chainer variable, right? So this is an image, for instance. Um, and then, yeah, so then I pass it through this original linear layer, uh, and then here's the non-PCA part. I call a ReLU uh, function on that, so that's a rectified linear unit, which is um, you know, going to be non-linear. And then I'm gonna do that again. And I'm gonna go down to a latent space, which is actually two times the dimension of what I originally wanted my latent space to be. And the reason for that is that I'm going to separate that. And I'm basically just gonna kind of have the latent space and cleave it into two, right? And I'm gonna call half of those parameters uh, means and half of them variances. And then I'm going to resample from normal distributions with those parameters. This is the variational step. And what that effectively does is it injects noise into the mix, right? Because you know, if I just had a normal autoencoder, what could happen feasibly if I don't have enough image data is that I have enough parameters here to effectively just memorize all of my images, right? And so that's no good. Like, we don't want models that are, that are just going to memorize your data. They don't generalize very well, and they're pretty useless. Um, so instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that my latent encoding space is somewhat probabilistic, right? So I'm going to say that it's actually drawn from a distribution, a parametric distribution that's given by these normal distributions um, with these parameters. And then I'm going to resample that, and then I'll pass those back through the decoding section and so that's kind of the variational step. It injects noise in the middle and some uncertainty so that if I pass the same image through and through, I'm not going to get exactly the same encoding. And so it's really much harder for me to actually memorize those images by doing this. You literally just chop it in half. Literally just chop it in half, yep. And I'll, I'll show you the exact code. <laughs> so, so yeah, so this noise here, yes? How do you back propagate against that? Yeah, you back prop, I'll, I'll go into that in just a sec, yeah. Um, Okay, so this is how you backpropagate against that. Uh, uh, right? This is to prevent overfitting, yes. Yeah, so you backpropagate against that by doing this sort of reparameterization trick, which is to say that um, I take my means and I, or I take a standard normal distribution and I'm just restaling a, rescaling a standard normal to be centered around a new mean with a new variance by just multiplying by a constant factor. So that's how I'm kind of, not how I'm doing it. This is a paper written by some other people, which I'll show you later. But this is how they kind of get around the issue of not being able to back propagate through a sampling layer. Yeah. And then, yeah, and so, so on the other side, right, you're just doing the exact same thing on the output end. Um, and then you have this sort of drop in term, which is a Gaussian KL divergence. Um, and that really is just, and, and I'm, I'm specifying uh, 
a prior distribution here of, of a normal distribution that's centered around zero with a standard deviation of one. And what that effectively does, so the KL divergence is actually measuring kind of how disparate these two distributions are, the ones that I've trained uh, with those mu's and sigmas, and the ones that are just uh, normal distributions with zero mean and standard deviation one. And so what that's effectively doing is giving me a kind of regularization process because it's adding into my loss function something which is going to give me a higher loss if I have something which is further away from um, the mean, which is zero, and uh, something which is very low in standard deviation. So it's basically saying that if I'm really certain about parameters which are very different from zero, I better be quite certain because it's going to cost me in my loss function at the end of the day. And then the other section is just going to be my mean squared error, okay, which, which is just what we talked about earlier for the reconstruction. And then I go through and I back propagate. And that's pretty much it. I'm running a little low on time, so I kind of wanted to get to the results, um, which is so after, after you do the process of this training, the nice thing is that you know, I can actually just throw away the encoding part of, the, uh, of this whole process, and I can pick you know, random parameters if I wanted to. Okay? So here I've actually initialized the initial encoding to one of our shirts in our, 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 uh, our inventory, and I'm actually picking, we can kind of inspect and see what's going on in these dimensions by picking certain dimensions and then ranging back and forth through one of those parameters at a time. So if you will, this is kind of the, like, um, this is ranging back and forth over one of the dimensions at a time, so taking specific slicings. Um, and you can see, you know, there's, there's some interesting variation. There's like short red shirt, tank top blue, right? They're not supremely interpretable, which is somewhat unfortunate, but we wouldn't really expect them to be anyway. What we really hope for, at the end of the day is from a modeling standpoint that they're meaningful. Um, and then you can actually just input random parameters altogether and generate wholly new synthetic shirts that you know, have never before been seen. So this is kind of a fun thing to do. I like just generating random shirts from time to time. It's interesting. Um, people have done this with other things, which I'm about to show you. And you can do it for yourself. Um, it's all up on GitHub uh, at stitchfix slash photograph. Um, and you can just take the model. It actually comes with some command line tools, uh, which um, you know, you can pip install it also. So you pip install photograph. It comes with some command line tools to download an image set, which is a Hubble image set, uh, train a simple model, um, and then uh, generate uh, new images based on what you've trained, just new random images. All right. So, yeah. So when you come here, you speak about trained weights. It's really a matrix of weights going from each of the inputs that you present. Yep. It outputs whatever it outputs, yeah. Because you've trained the, the decoding process, right? This generative process you've trained on images in your data set. So then I get to pick you know, some, some point in my vector space or my multidimensional space and say, hey, what image does that correspond to? Do you generally start with original images that go to your original input layer? Or do you start with no, I, I start completely randomly, yeah. No, yeah, that's what I mean, is I start with a random 30, 30, like 30 random numbers, okay. feed that through the decoding step, okay. and then I get these images back. Mm -hmm. And so this is what happens when you uh, train it onto Hubble uh, stuff. These are randomly generated images from that, so kind of the, what it thinks of is like, I train it on like nebula and galaxies and things, so you know, what, of it, what it thinks of is those. Um, and then this is interesting. Someone on Twitter had posted this. Um, he did this process with uh, the tool that I had mentioned on some images of faces. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is that there's kind of an issue with this, which is, to, which is scaling to higher resolution images. Um, so that's a big problem, right? Like we talked about before, this 60,000 node input, right, for just a 100 by 200 image. Um, if we step down, which is a fairly aggressive step down, to 4,000 uh, as our next uh, width of our next layer, um, that's already 240 million parameters for all of those if you want to do a fully connected layer for all those weights. And at 32 bits a piece, that's 960 megabytes. So for the encoding and decoding, you know, you've already got a two gig system and you've only passed it through um, you know, a relatively small number of layers. And so um, if you want to do this, and you definitely want to do this probably on a GPU for anything reasonably at scale, um, that's not going to fit into memory on your GPUs. 
Um, so you want at least your model to fit into memory on the GPUs, if not, you know, all of your data, right? So, um, so there, there's a solution, which is to basically reduce the number of parameters before you start to pass it through this fully connected set. Um, and you do that by, uh, by passing it through convolutional layers uh, at the very beginning. And that kind of reduces your parameter space before you pass it through these fully connected layers. And that's actually coming soon. It's actually up on a branch on GitHub right now. It works, but I haven't uh, fully tested it yet. So, you know, use at your own risk there. Um, okay, yeah, and any questions? Oh, I should point out too, uh, I've written a blog post, it's up on the Stitch Fix multi-threaded blog uh, on this process, and it goes a little bit more into some of the details behind the variational step. Um, and so maybe you want to read that if you're interested. And there's the original paper up at the top. Yeah. Yes. So effectively, so what I'm doing, uh, the reason that it's a variational autoencoder rather than just an autoencoder is, yeah, so when, I'm, when, I, when I get to my, roughly my encoding layer, right, I'm splitting the data apart. So I, I, I generate a, a layer which is two times the dimension that, of what I actually want. I split it in half. I call half of that means and half of that variances. And then I sample from normal distribution, so from Gaussians, um, uh, so these just standard bell curves, right? I'm sampling from those with those specific parameters. So I say it's centered around my mean, the bell curve centered around my mean, and its width is controlled by that variance. Um, so for each pair I'm sampling. And that's, that's the variational step. That's the step that's sort of injecting noise and preventing some memorization of, of this, uh, of, of like these clothing items, for instance. Yes? The, sorry? You mean like do I cut it in half? No, I don't cut anything. I'm just, I'm, I'm putting in raw images. Maybe it'd be nice to cut it in half. That would reduce my, uh, <laughs> my input image by half, yeah. Uh, no, I don't do that though. There are, there, are some, there are some patternings which would be hard to do that with, right, on shirts. So, so it's usually like, unless you want to deal with just solid things or just symmetric shirts, it's kind of hard to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, but that's not a bad idea. I could think about probably ways in which you might want to do that. Um, yeah, I would have to think about it a little bit more, but um, no, in short, I haven't tried anything like that. So you have experimented with higher resolution, right? Yep. What, so what kind of hardware uh, you need? Actually using the same GPU that I used before. So all of this is done on AWS with their GPU spot instances. So those come with four gigs of memory on them. Um, and so, yeah, like you can go get one of those and, and also train on the GPU. I should mention uh, that these command line tools by, also by default don't use GPU. That's an option. Um, so you have to specify that when you, when you try to use GPUs on these. Yes? Pre-processing? Uh, yeah, you know, I... I, I so I thought about possibly doing a PCA, but you know that's basically in effect kind of just adding another layer onto the network, um, but minus like modulo the the nonlinear transformation at the very end, which is uh, these ReLU layers or these ReLU functions. Um, yeah, I I didn't try doing PCA. Um, I thought about it, but I kind of thought that that would at the end of the day be a little bit more just like uh, well, first off, the reason that I would want to do PCA is to do dimensionality reduction, right? And if I'm doing that, then I'm not going to get a nice invertible process to get back to my original image. So it's actually really hard to use autoencoders if I, if I want to actually reduce the dimension before inputting it through this autoencoder process. So that's, that's actually like kind of the reason that I didn't do it. But, but you could think of like possibly ways in which you might just do a PCA as like a pre-processing and then do some sort of like probabilistic method on the back end to try to reconstruct, or maybe not do PCA on the back end to, to reconstruct, but add just an additional 
layer to your neural network or something, and it'll learn those proper parameters, yeah. Oh, I should mention, by the way, uh, I mean, you mean like in general? Or just like with this process? Because this is not actually in production yet. So I've, I've been testing this, but like this is not something that we're currently doing to try to like do modeling, right? Yeah, so in general, I mean, we take lots of input from our stylists um, in terms of like lots of interface things we've, we like and it, whether or not like they feel like the things that are being presented to them are better or worse. Um, definitely, there's a lot of stylist input that goes into that. Um, at the end of the day, we have pretty hard metrics for whether or not something was successful, um, you know, whether or not someone kept an item of clothing or not, whether or not their you know, satisfaction rating was high or low. So, um, so we tend to focus on those a little bit more, but yeah, we definitely take stylus input into account as well. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that was a, a little bit of a point of tension um, for a little while. Yeah, we were, we were sort of thinking about constructing our own, you know, GPU box. Um, the problem with that is that, you know, then a lot of people kind of want to use it, and then they get expensive because you have to buy more of them, and then you have to maintain them, and then there's these, you know, information security sorts of reasons. You know, you don't want to have to, like, always log into those and in, in your internal firewall and... Yeah, so it's it's much nicer just to do it on AWS. Uh, I started off doing scripts. Now I'm using a Jupyter notebook to to interface with it, just because I get way more feedback right away, and I don't have to like pull down images that I've generated when I'm like inspecting what it's doing. So yeah, it's nice. I get I can just present them on the screen. Cool. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.